I remember my mother having a, a go at me and I said, listen, one day with this funny voice of mine, I'm going to make a lot of money. Some people have an aura what is pink and others have an aura what is blue. And when I saw Madam, I said to myself, Madam has an aura what is purple with white stripes. <laughs> Wendy has a fun, bubbly voice. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like Marilyn Monroe because it's not as babyish as that, but it's got a childlike quality to it. Her voice did start her off and her voice is still still going. Here, are you suggesting I'm common? <laughs> Somebody said, and I think quite rightly, they likened my voice to broken brown ale bottles being dragged down a cobble street. It was this voice that put Wendy on the road to stardom when in 1962 she was chosen to be the voice on Mike Sand's record, Come Outside. The guy who produced the record, Robert Stigwood, said, um, yes, it sounds great. I keep hearing this girl like in Baby It's Cold Outside. So in comes Wendy with this broad Cockney accent. And Stigwood said, that's right, that's the voice I want. Three times I went back, adding more to it each time and I got paid five pounds a session. That was 15 quid, and it sold over half a million copies. The record got to number one, and it launched her into celebrity, because, I mean, she was an original. To have that very, very strong Cockney accent immediately meant that she could get character parts, and from being a model, she was suddenly vaulted into a, an acting career. Because then people wanted to know who I was. So really, it doesn't matter I only got 15 quid for it because I earned a lot more from it in the end. Although thought of as the archetypal Cockney, Wendy, an only child, was not born in London. I was actually born in Middlesbrough in the North East. I did not know she was born in Middlesbrough. I did not know yeah. she was born in Middlesbrough. I no. I'd like to check on that. Yes. <laughs> yes. I've always thought of her as being a London girl, very much a London girl. She knows all the best pubs in London. My parents were in the licence trade and my father was running a hotel up there at the time. My most formative years, I suppose, were when my father was manager of the, the Shepherd's Tavern in Shepherd Market. And th that was one of my happiest times. Her happy childhood ended at the age of 11, when her father took his own life. It was Wendy you found him, lying in front of the gas fire in their family home. In order for her mother to carry on working, Wendy was sent to boarding school. My mother encouraged me. She wasn't a showbiz mother or anything like that. She wasn't pushy. I think she thought, well, I've got to be able to do something with this child. <laughs> so that's why I was sent to drama school. My first main series was Harper's West One, which was about a department store. Slightly more upmarket than Grace Brothers, but not as grand as Selfridges. I remember my first episode, I played the receptionist, Susan Sullivan. I was terrible. I came in through this door and there was this little voice. I mean, the sound blokes must have been doing their nut, you know. It's all, hello, I'm Susan Sullivan and I'm set. God, I, I see it's still there, logged in the back of my pea-sized brain. God, it was awful. I did one of the early soaps for the BBC called The Newcomers, and that's when I was the teenage daughter. Burrows, I thought I'd find you in oh, here. Oh, hello then, lover. How are you then? Oh, push off, hairy face. Well, what's the trouble, Joyce? Well, this man ought to have a load of tins on his foot. He's going to sue us. Oh. <laughs> here, uh, do you want a drink while you're here then? Oh, no, thanks. People might hold it against me. While working on the BBC comedy series Hugh and I, Wendy first met writer and producer David Croft. He was to play an enormous part in her career. You see, the thing is with David, he will see someone in a very small part, small role, and then he'll, he'll give them a role in something of his. And it's as though he has this massive filing cabinet. I mean, we're all part of Crofty's repertory company, really. And then when the right thing comes along, you're there. Throughout the 70s, Wendy appeared in several of David's shows. I did uh, one episode of At Pompeii with Frankie Howard. I was playing Sopia, the court scrubber. And Mary Husband, the costume designer, she got me this almost a frock. It was stuck on with toupee tape. It was so, it's the lowest cut thing I think I've ever worn. Here you are. You having another raffle? Having a what? Another raffle. 
Oh. Yes, and this time you aren't the prize, so don't bother. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear, poor soul. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to have to carry around all day. <laughs> Uh, Frankie wasn't easy to cope with at all. He was very tough on other actors and would walk over them and be quite ruthless, you know. And uh, But she's a very resilient girl and uh, she, I think she took her own notice, really. He wasn't a man that tolerated fools, gladly, and I must admit, I'm, as the older I get, the more I get like him, I think. But um, I remember standing next to him in rehearsal because apparently he'd got rid of a couple of other girls before I went in. And I remember he took my hand and he shook it, he said, you know, beside him, he says, don't be frightened of me, darling, come along. And we did it. Sophia, Sophia, please, leave him alone, the young master. I know, I know where he hasn't been, please. Now, find your straws and get out. I've still got them on. No. <laughs> straws, not drawers. <laughs> Oh, she's common, she really is. To be in Dad's army was like being invited to join an exclusive gentleman's club. Joe Walker and friend. Friend, how are you? Hey, how are you? Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Trust you to turn up with a tart. <laughs> Look, are you going to give me a kiss or not? You're just like all men. You use the girl, and when you're finished with her, you cast her off. Well, it's not safe out there. No, it's not safe under here, either. I don't think that's the class of girl we want here at all, Wilson. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Don't be daft. It's me, isn't it? <laughs> I have a, a joke with David. I say, the reason I'm so fond of you is you're the only producer I've worked for more than once. <laughs> but it was her role as sales assistant, Shirley Brahms, that was to make Wendy a household name. It was Molly Sutherland um, and Frank Thornton and Trevor Bannister and Wendy Richard. And I was the only one I'd never heard of. David, as I recall, had used Wendy on previous occasions. And again, one of those things where he, uh, you know, discovers somebody and remembers them, and when he comes to do something, that's who we're going to have. David knew that she would deliver the goods. Sorry I'm late, Captain Peacock. That's all right, Miss Brown. Oh, it's all right for her, is it? <laughs> she has been powdering her nose. Well, why is it so shiny, then? <laughs> the successful points of I being served was the pecking order. To your counter, Mr. Lucas. Sure. That pecking order was very important because it created a lot of the controversy and the conflict between the characters. If you get promotion, does that mean I'll get your job? Well, normally they'd give my job to somebody of my age. What's the matter? You look very depressed. I was just thinking I might not live that long. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Slocum was always, always definitely the boss. But she did need Miss Brahms. She was a very lonely woman and she wanted Miss Brahms as her friend because she had to have somebody to talk to. Uh, that's of the main street in a Jaxi. Oh, my girlfriend went there last year, but she didn't like it. Every time she went out, she got her bottom pinched. Well, of course, that only happens to a certain class of person. I mean, my friend Mrs Elthrop and me walked up and down there one entire evening and nothing happened. <laughs> the shop was totally out of date. There's nothing like that around today. So therefore, the show, as it were, was history. Rather like Dad's Army, you see. That was old fashioned when it was made. Consequently, it doesn't date, because it was dated to start with. The wonderful thing is, the jokes were old 30 years ago. Which one do you think suits me best? This one or this one? Oh, if I was you, I'd stick to that. <laughs> I being served, I think, could best be described as good old British end of the pier comedy. <laughs> Here, listen, I don't know how to wear my braces. Should they be like that or like that? <laughs> the word subtlety didn't really come into our vocabulary very often, I think. Um, and it, it, I think this was its great appeal. There was nothing offensive in it. It was all self-cleaning jokes, no bad language. And if Mrs Slocum was talking about her pussy, it was soon made clear she was referring to a cat. You know, this sort of thing just isn't fair on my pussy. <laughs> she has a go at the furniture if I'm not there, promise. Well, Shirley and I are going to the pictures. 
I haven't said yes yet. I wasn't going to ask you that question till after we came out. <laughs> I tried my best during the entire series to get into her drawers. I only succeeded in opening the third one behind the counter, I think, to find a tape measure on one occasion. Miss Brown's never really welcomed Mr Lucas's attentions. She wouldn't have anything to do with him. What a pity your ear rolls aren't a bit bigger. Why? Because then you could shove a toothbrush in them and clean out that filthy mind of yours. <laughs> I think Captain Peacock might have harboured a secret passion for Miss Brahms. Oh, Captain Peacock fancied Miss Brahms, of course. When she, when she had to adjust her stockings, you know, his eyes were there. And she had very good legs. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Peacock, Captain, Captain Peacock, Peacock was straightened his tie yeah. when he was nearer, yeah. yes. It was just an indication that he was yeah. overcome with emotion. <laughs> she knew full well that he fancied her like rotten, and she'd use that. I think Miss <laughs> Brown should be given a chance. She's been showing a lot of promise. <laughs> Actually, showing a lot more than I expected. It annoys me when people refer to her as a bimbo. She wasn't. She had more sense than most of them all put together. I can't understand it, you know. I have a big meal every night. I don't know how you can afford it. I can't. I have to keep going out with these fellas I don't like just to keep body and soul together. Oh, I couldn't do that. Oh, it's easy. I wear a low frock. They have a good look and I have a good look. <laughs> In 1972, as her career was taking off, Wendy's mother sadly died of cancer. Almost immediately, she married businessman Len Black, nearly 20 years her senior. The marriage lasted only five months. We had this B&B &B opposite St Pancras Station because we had to have a home and a business. And I carried on for two years after I lost Mummy and I just couldn't cope. And also, you see, when we first bought the hotel, it was there weren't the cheap holidays abroad, so you got the same people coming down from the north year after year, same fortnight they would book or the same week. And so it was quite a steady trade, but then it started to change and... The trade wasn't... Well, it was rough trade, actually. She used to call it a brotel, which I think is posh for a brothel. So I just thought, well, I've got to get out of here. So I sold up, and it wasn't until February 1974 I actually had my own front door. That was the first private dwelling I had ever lived in. She always used to say, I've got a room now, I've got a flat now with 13 rooms. And I'm glad because I never have to move out of my bedroom again. Because apparently, if the, the hotel got very full, she might have to go into a caravan in the backyard. With the breakdown of her second marriage to advertising executive Will Thorpe, Wendy turned to the rest of the cast for support. That was the nice thing about the programme. We were all very supportive of each other, um, both in our work and in our private lives. Um, and if people as Wendy was, suffering tragedy at that time. Everyone was very supportive and very sympathetic, very understanding. It's called Doctor Theatre, really. It's, uh, when you, uh, whatever's going on in your private life, whether you're feeling unwell or you're having a domestic problem, and you have to go and perform and not let other people down, suddenly you can go and do it, you know. It might great, not feel too good afterwards, but you can... It's a great rallying point for your spirit, really. Yes. We'd worked so much together that we almost felt like a family. We all knew each other very well. You're bound to. And I do think it was very important to Wendy. We used to drink together and go out to eat together and uh, have wonderful picnic lunches on recording days in somebody's dressing room on a Sunday. Um, and we'd all bring food. Wendy uh, used to provide the smoked salmon, didn't she? Yes. Or was it the champagne? Uh, champagne and smoked salmon, yes. I think, yes. <laughs> Well, she was a great champagne drinker. I never knew Wendy drink anything other than champagne, oh, no. ever. No, no, she was very high maintenance, the, I think. Yes. <laughs> and it was champagne all the way when she was offered the part of Pauline Fowler. While we were doing The Newcomers, one of our new directors there was a lady called Julia Smith. And then at the end of 84, she and Tony Holland had the idea for this soap, which was codenamed E8. In EastEnders, when it started, Wendy was the only one who had what you would call a name. Julia didn't really want people who were well-known, but she really wanted Wendy. Yes, Mum, we're having a baby, and we're glad. And if you can't be glad for us, well, it's too bad, cos we're having a baby cos we want it. 
We are having the baby. We, not you. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw Wendy. It was um, August '84. I mean, I'd seen her on telly when when I was growing up, and it was I think it was the press launch. I can remember Wendy wearing these yellow waterproofs with her um, a cigarette holder. And all that. Like, I was petrified of her. Absolutely. Pet I think it was three months before I spoke to her. Oh, when. Uh... We were starting off doing the, the tests and makeup checks and all this sort of thing with the characters. And I had really lovely long hair. It was lovely thick hair. And Julia said, I'm going to have to ask you to have your hair cut. Oh, I was so upset. I was in the hairdressers all day. I was crying. All we've got to do now is arrange for you to have a test. But the thing is, I remember I wrote down a list of what makeup I used to give to the makeup designer. And when I went into makeup, there's a tiny wee bag there with a base and some mascara and an eyebrow pencil, and that was it, you know. And of course, I'd been used to having three different coloured eyeshadows and shading and all that. No more, you know, bare minimum. Our family, the Fowlers and the Beals, were based on Tony Holland's real life relatives. Yeah, I've got some beer, sis. The Beale family were supposed to be down to earth, salt of the earth, the ones with their feet on the ground. I said fish and chips, but on me. Don't argue. Don't you argue. Now, how much was the sting? Nine quid. Oh, God, I wish I'd kept me mouth shut. Yeah. I mean, the old days, it was everybody around the Fowlers and used to dread those things because you try getting nine people on that set, it was a nightmare. Oh, I've oh, done it again! <laughs> it's you! It's you been chucking tea leaves down the sink! Use the tidy. Oh, yeah, that's why I'm standing here looking like a calm bun. <laughs> Eat. What's all this? What does it look like? It's my birthday. Wrong. It's our wedding anniversary. Wrong. You've got a job. No. I think Pauline and Arthur stayed together so long through sheer grit and determination, and uh, Pauline was. Uh, a one-man woman, and that was that. You, you're the soppiest man in the world. I yeah, know, that's why you're friends with me. <laughs> her family are her life. That's all she cares about. And when you think the grief that some of them have caused her... Well, Paul hasn't had to cope with that much. I mean, it was her daughter's teenage pregnancy. I'm pregnant. Oh, and then Mark ran away. We are going to find him, Arthur. I can sense it. I'm not just kidding myself. Then when he did come back, of course, he had HIV. If you swim in the sewer, you catch something. And Mark has. <gasps> Meanwhile, back at the ranch, we've had Arthur stealing the Christmas money in order to pride Michelle with a wedding. Can't do it, Dad. But then Arthur went to prison. Who'd have thought your dad would steal him? He's, all his life, he's, he's been as straight as a die. Then what was the... You have been having an affair with a middle-aged lush. But Pauline, please, don't you stay away from me, Arthur! You're just a lying little slut. Hi, darling. I mean, it's, it's nothing much, really. She's very protective of her set, because I made a remark about the fruit bowl one day. Don't move that fruit bowl, she said. I mean, she was quite vehement about it, you know. That bowl is always there, she said. If there is one item out of place on that set, the designer gets given hell. How was your date, then? It wasn't a date. Oh, so it wasn't a success? Oh, Wendy hates right. using props. She just, she just wants to talk. Um, we had this director, Kenny Glennon. He likes a lot of movement. So he made me stationary and he told Wendy that she had to sort of go in, get a rubbish bag, bring it out, say a line, go back in, get a rubbish bag, bring it out, say a line. So she crossed me four times, each time with a new rubbish bag, taking it in, taking it. And then she went and got the broom. Wendy's face was an absolute picture. She's, I haven't told you, have I? <laughs> Don't do props. <laughs> She was not happy. <laughs> you could literally see everybody clearing. <laughs> Wendy doesn't like props at all. I wouldn't say not a great lover. I'd say she just dislikes a bit. She always says, and mostly gets away with it, I can't walk and talk at the same time. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I thought you did the morning shift. Oh, I've got to do double shift today. Oh.
It's funny, you know, people say, surely people in the square must have washing machines. We've all got washing machines in our house. It's a service wash. Oh, yeah, we'll take it in now. I'll be in in a minute. It's much easier to go give Paul in a service wash. Doing his washing now, are we? That's all I am doing. Sometimes you get journalists saying, how different is your life to Pauline's? And you think, well, I don't work in a laundrette and I don't have any children. I am an actress. Um, but in some respects, I think I have the same strength of character as Pauline and the same grit and determination, but without being hard. She's a very strong actress. She's a very natural actress. She's an instinctive actress. Wendy is very, very good to work with. Life is so precious. You just... You just want to cuddle your children a little bit tighter. Smell the flowers a little bit longer. Just one day. What would Ethel have done with her day, Doc? One day and you took it away. You have to be pretty tough to survive in this business. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not very tough. I do have my moments, you know, and I do shed a tear. I do get upset about things. But um, I wouldn't be me if I wasn't. Sadly for Wendy, her third marriage to carpet fitter Paul Glorney also ended in divorce. She had a lot of ups and downs in her emotional life. And uh, I think perhaps at times found it very difficult to actually hold on to a relationship. I hope and pray that my dear friend, Wendy, will never get married again. She can go and live with as many people as she likes. But I, I don't know what it is. Every time she gets married, something disastrous happens. I mean, it's, it's not easy, no matter who you are in this programme, trying to juggle a private life and a public life. And, I mean, there's certain things that you're not ashamed of, but you don't necessarily want everybody to read because that's your life. That's not your character, that's you. My Valentine Day's present in 1996, we've told I had breast cancer. See, I was very lucky. Believe you me, I know how lucky I was that I only had to have radiotherapy, and that in itself was bad enough, seven weeks of concentrated radiotherapy. And I didn't realise how tired it was going to make me. The first I knew of it was that I was rung up from someone, uh, by someone from a paper, who said, uh, how do you feel about your friend Wendy Richard having cancer? And I just said, are you sure? It scared us all. Um... <sighs> I, I think during the first couple of months, she did find it quite difficult. Um, sort of with the medication and stuff that she was on, how she was being treated, and coming into work here, it was very. I think she found it very tiring. I mean, if I have a very long day, then I have to lie down in my dressing room at lunchtime. You know, I, I have to try and recoup some energy or find a set with a bed in it and go and lie on that in between scenes. With a career spanning four decades. Wendy Richard was awarded an MBE for services to television drama. My mother, wherever she is, she would have been absolutely ecstatic. One of the nice things about the work she's done, although she's always been in the public eye, she's always Wendy Richard. She's never really been associated with Miss Brahms or Pauline Fowler. And taxi drivers are inclined to shout at her, hello, Wendy, how are you doing? They, they know her name. I'm very grateful to my 15 years in, in EastEnders. It means I can have fresh-cut flowers in the sitting room every day. I've got a comfortable home. I can have my manicure when I want it, and I can go to the hairdressers, because when you're unemployed, it's luxuries like that that are the first things to go.